Welcome to chapter 28 of Traditions and Encounters, the Islamic Empires. Last time we left off in the Middle East, the Byzantine Empire, which was also known as the Eastern Roman Empire, was starting to crumble. And the Ottoman Empire, which was founded by a bunch of Turks, started to come into power. So the Ottoman Empire was founded in 1289, and it was led by these Muslim religious warriors. Ultimately, the Ottomans expanded into the Byzantine Empire, seized city after city, and eventually started to control much of the Eastern Roman Empire. They had a central group of troops known as the Janissaries, and these were basically slave troops. They were Christian boys that they captured and forced to convert into Islam, and eventually they would fight on behalf of these Ottomans. One important ruler of the Ottomans was Mehmed the Conqueror. He ruled from 1451 to 1481. He is most notable because he captured Constantinople in 1453. That was the Byzantine capital at the time and really the last strong major hold for the Byzantine Empire. He converted the name of Constantinople into Istanbul, which ultimately became the Ottoman capital, which is in Turkey today. He possessed an absolute monarchy which basically formed a centralized state, so most of the power was actually controlled in Istanbul. And he expanded vastly to places such as Serbia, Greece, Albania, and even attacked Italy. He was really trying to expand into Western Europe a little bit and retain more lands than the Eastern Romans had possessed. After him, there was Suleiman the Magnificent. He was notable because he hoped to occupy Syria and Egypt, so expanding this Ottoman and Muslim empire even more. He also expanded into Southwest Asia and Central Europe, further increasing the strongholds of the Byzantines, or or rather in this case the Ottomans. And he also helped build a powerful navy that was big enough to challenge the European fleets that were just starting to rise at this time from places such as Britain. Another Muslim empire was the Safavid Empire. So the Safavids were Turkish conquerors of Persia and Mesopotamia, so they were more east than these Ottomans. They claimed the ancient Persian title of Shah, the founder, Shah Ismail, claimed this title to sort of legitimize his rule and be able to rule Persia more effectively because, of course, this was what Persians had always been accustomed to. So he sort of created his own system to try to get the support of the native Persians who he conquered. He had a lot of lands and basically continued to help expand Islam in the Middle East to what is basically a very predominantly Muslim nation today of Iran. Another important figure of Persia during this time was Shah Abbas the Great. He revitalized the Safavid Empire. Eventually, the Safavids started to fall in Persia because of different factors, but he helped to sort of bring the Safavid Empire back into greatness. He modernized the military and sought European alliances against the Ottomans, so the Ottomans were really expanding big at this time, almost conquering some parts of Persia, and in allying with the Europeans, he was able to more effectively help possess and control his own Persian lands. He also established a new capital at Isfahan, which was really this grand capital city. And he also practiced centralized administration, basically securing all the power in the capital as well. Over in India, there was the Mughal Empire. One ruler of the Mughals was Babur, and he was the founder of the Mughal, which was also a Mongol dynasty in India. So although the Mongols didn't truly go into India, they did have a small branch controlling parts of India. And he was a Central Asian Turkish adventurer who invaded India in 1523 and seized the port city of Delhi. By his death in 1530, the Mughal Empire embraced most of India, so that further expanded the Mongol Empire, sort of. Another ruler after him was Akbar, who was a brilliant and charismatic ruler. Akbar controlled and created a centralized absolutist government, kind of like some countries in Western Europe. And he encouraged and expanded to places even more south than what the original Mughal emperor had sort of conquered. This also made him and encouraged him 
to promote religious tolerance between the Muslims and Hindus because he was Muslim, but India, as it still is today, is predominantly Hindu. He even developed a syncretic religion called the Divine Faith. This was sort of like a syncretic religion between Islam and Hinduism, and although it didn't really gain much believers or converts, it really helped to promote these two religions to coexist a bit more peacefully during his time. The similarities between these three empires were that they continued the Islamic tradition set by the Umayyad and Abbasid empires. They produced dynastic states with emperors and Islam as a central pillar to their administrations. All three Islamic empires were military creations, so they were founded by military rulers and they ruled with military force. And the authority of the dynasty was derived from personal piety and the military strongness of these rulers. They also devoted themselves strongly to Islam and encouraged their rulers to extend their faith to new lands. It's kind of like the Crusades in Christianity, but the Islam form of it. They also had steppe traditions, so they originated from steppes in Central Asia. And they were mostly autocratic, so the emperors imposed their will on the state and didn't really give the people much choice to speak out. There were also ongoing problems with royal secession in all of these empires, so rulers could legally kill their brothers after taking the throne to make sure they would possess power. Royal women often wielded great influence on politics as well because they were able to seduce the men. Economically, agriculture and trade was also big during this time. Major crops such as wheat and rice really fueled the growth of these empires. They were not really impacted though by the American crops, but imports of coffee and tobacco did become very popular as luxury items for these people. Population growth, although it occurred as well with better nutrition and stuff, is less dramatic than in China or Europe, which was more heavily impacted by the American trade. And the significant population growth really occurred in India because there was much more intense agriculture there. Long distance trade improved and was important to all three empires as well. They traded a bunch of luxury goods such as silks, carpets, and ceramics. Carpets were really known to be an Ottoman product during this time to European trading companies, the joint stock companies. Also, the Mughal Empire was less attentive to foreign or maritime training because they were the Mongols and they were sort of more focused on the land aspect, not the merchants that were primarily followers of Islam. The Mughals did permit stations for English, French, and Dutch trading companies. So the Mughals, in addition to allowing traditional Islamic merchants to trade, they allowed Europeans to come in. Religious affairs also occurred. So religious diversity was one of the challenges to the rule of these empires. Even though Islam was the dominant religion, there were also other religions here. And under the rule of Akbar in India, there were many different types of Christians that also came in. So the Portuguese, who were Protestants, Jesuits, the Catholics, Sikhism, which was a new faith combining elements of Hinduism and Islam also came into power. And of course, he advocated for the divine faith that was loyal to the emperor, but didn't really gain much traction. These minorities generally tolerated these Islamic states because sometimes they were still allowed to practice their old religions, even though sometimes they were taxed as well, which is, of course, something that is read in traditions and encounters and old world encounters, the jizya. Also during this time, there was the cultural patronage of the Islamic emperors, all three sponsored arts and public works, so mosques, palaces, schools, hospitals, really to help the people create a better civilization. Istanbul, the Ottoman capital, was a bustling city as well with lots of trade and lots of people as well. Out of this came really a unique Islamic tradition of art and culture that is still seen in many places around the world today. In India especially, during this time, the Mughal architecture was really prevalent, and the most famous, of course, was the Taj Mahal, which was an exquisite example of this Ottoman and Islamic influence, in which basically the emperor had built this palace for his wife after his wife died. Eventually, it became this really renowned architectural piece in world history. Eventually, though, all these imperial leadership 
role started to decline by the 16th to 18th century, and these empires started to decline as well. Basically, negligent rulers, different factions or different regions and groups started to go against each other, and government corruption also broke down the centralized absolute rule that many of these empires were built upon. Tensions increased between religious conservatives and those who wanted tolerance as well. So the conservatives were fundamentalists. They didn't really want the definition of Islam to change, but the tolerant or the more liberal sorts of Muslims, they sort of wanted to be more open to the foreign faiths. And as a result, these two groups clashed as well. This is intra-faith conflict. And the Ottomans really resisted innovations like the telescope and printing press. This didn't really help their civilization advance as well. And the Safavids, the Shias and Sunnis, which were two groups of Muslims, they started to persecute each other and they even persecuted non-Muslims. This caused problems in Persia as well. And Mughal India, the Hindus were really being oppressed even though they were still the majority. Economically and militarily, they decline as well. So the strong economies were followed by weak economies. Also the end of territorial expansion. So it was difficult to support these large armies and bureaucrats whenever they expanded to foreign countries. And that with a bunch of long and costly wars really started to cut the bank uh, in many of these empires. So these officials had to sort of consolidate their holdings back at home. These officials resorted to raising taxes or corruption to deal with these finance problems. Of course, the people, once they figured this out, weren't really happy about this and lost faith in their rulers. Also, they weren't able to develop trade and industry, and the European merchants eventually displaced these Muslim merchants because they, of course, had more money and had their risk more spread out with joint stock companies. Militarily, the European weapons of guns and steel gave way. And eventually, the Europeans became the more powerful military forces. The arsenals of these Islamic empires were also outdated. They weren't really innovating new weaponry like the Europeans. And the Ottomans even lost their big fleet of ships and weren't really able to control their ships and navy as well. Finally, there was cultural clashes. There was cultural conservatism, so Muslims didn't really travel to the West because they were thought that they were superior and were kind of ignorant to the European technological developments, developments such as the telescope. This didn't help their science advance at all. They also didn't like the printing press again. And even though Jewish refugees brought it into the Ottomans and these other Islamic empires, they didn't really like it. And they even banned printing in Turkish and Arabic, which were their languages. Eventually, though, the ban was lifted, although it still wasn't really popular. Of course, the printing press really rev revolutionized the way people taught and thought and expressed their ideas. So with the Muslims not having this technology, it was kind of hard to preserve and expand their view and their civilization. In India, basically the same thing. The Mughal rulers weren't really interested and eventually, foreign and cultural innovations were seen as a threat to political stability. So they were met with lots of anger by these Islamic empires. And eventually, because they weren't able to compete with Europe, which was on the rise with imperialism at this time, they started to decline. So in conclusion, this has been Chapter 28, The Islamic Empires. Thanks so much for watching and hope to see you in the next one when we continue the story of the world.